At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian Regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. One day, at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? He asked. The angel answered, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon, who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon, the tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that had happened and sent them to Joppa. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat, and while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals, as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. They called out, asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you. So get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Peter went down and said to the men, I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? The men replied, We have come from Cornelius, the centurion. He is a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to ask you to come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. Then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guests. The next day, Peter st started out with them, and some of the believers from Joppa went along. The following day, he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at the feet in reverence. But Peter made him get up. Stand up, he said. I am only a man myself. While talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, You are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. But God had shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask why you sent for me? Cornelius answered, Three days ago, I was in my house praying at this hour. At three in the afternoon, suddenly a man in shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer and remembered your gift to the poor. Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He is a guest in the home of Simon the Tanner, who lives by the sea. So I sent for you immediately, and it was good for you to come. Now we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. Well, good morning, church. Imagine that I came before you this morning and I said, God talked to me and he told me to tell you to do something. I think, well, I'd hope that we have some mixed reactions. I'd hope there'd be at least some folks who would say, well, this is uncharacteristic of Bill. I trust Bill and I trust his relationship with God. And I, I can hear that and do that. Uh, I think for most of us, though, it would really depend on what's being told. If it's something very consistent with the kind of thing we think God would say, and we knew Bill really well, and we trusted him, and we did trust his relationship, um, okay, we could hear that. But if it were something that seemed really uncharacteristic of what we expected God to say, or we didn't have a lot of confidence in Bill, uh, or... Uh, specifically, if it required something really kind of crazy from us, we'd be a whole lot more skeptical. So what if God instead spoke directly to you? 
What if he came in, in the form of your dreams and, and maybe literally a dream like in our text this morning, or maybe just in your hopes and your desires, maybe a vision, maybe a sense of what God's doing. And even if it were a little more difficult or a little bit outside of the norm of how you would expect God to act, that you'd begin to see a fuller vision of who he is and what he wants. I expect that a number of us would want to say, at least at this point, yes, Lord. I mean, that's what we mean when we say Lord, is to say yes, Lord. And we expect that a God that doesn't already agree with everything we already think will challenge us to do things differently than we're doing them, to push us into new directions. The truth is, I believe that God wants to continue to give you direction, wants to continue to give you a dream. Now, it may not feel like that right now. We may feel very much enclosed with the stay-at-home orders. It may feel very much like God isn't saying much. But I want to tell you, I think God is speaking. The question is whether or not we are willing to listen, whether or not we are willing to receive the dreams that he has for us. You know, as he continues to give those dreams, it can be in, like I said, a very literal way of dreams, but it could also be through just the way he's built us. You realize over time he's built us in a certain way, we've had certain experiences, we have certain talents, and we may begin to see that the dream that God has for us has been realized over time. So I really want to broaden this out, though our text this morning is someone who received very poignant and acute kind of uh, dream and inspiration and direction from God. Uh, we may receive it in a more general sense, but I think the text still has something to tell us. And I think the first thing we need to realize is that the biggest barrier to dreaming the dreams of God as our own dreams is in fact our own dreams. You see, the biggest circumstances or the biggest uh, barriers are not our circumstances. It's not the fact that we are stay at home or the fact that there are things in our time of life and it keeps us from doing what God wants us to do. I do not believe that the biggest barrier to doing what God wants us to do and to dreaming his dreams is money. I don't think more money will necessarily give us what we need. We already have a God who owns the cattle on a thousand hills, who owns everything and can give us everything we need to do what he's done. So money isn't the barrier. It certainly isn't time. Uh, we may think we have very little time because we're extremely busy or we've got so much going on. But truthfully, God has given us exactly the kind of time we need to do what it is that he has asked us to do. And doing important, meaningful things for the kingdom of God is not based on whether or not we personally are extraordinary. In fact, God seems to relish the idea of using ordinary, everyday folks to accomplish extraordinary tasks. And tasks they may never really even see in their lifetime or, or know about, but that they begin to get the bits and pieces of their ordinary lives and give that over to God, and he does tremendous, powerful things with it. Our story today is about Peter, and we see him certainly throughout the book of Acts, and he's preaching, and he's doing miracles. We see extraordinary things, and we may forget that it started from very ordinary circumstances. He was a fisherman. He, if he knew anything, he knew how to fish. And Jesus came along, and after doing this miraculous, like, no, let's get so much fish that you can't quite hold them all, kind of experience with Peter, he says, come with me, and I will make you fishers of men, a fisher of people. Now, I suppose there is just some rhetorical flourish in that, that Jesus is talking to him and, and taking something he knows about fishing and says, well, we're going to apply this in other circumstances. But I, I believe in part he was also explaining and showing to Peter that this idea of, I am going to take who you are, what you know, and we're going to move it to some whole other area. 
into some whole other place that matters, that has an extraordinary purpose of God. I will make you a fisher of men. See, the dream, the bit that Jesus started to give Peter then and has given multiple times, including in today's text, about how he is going to be instrumental in moving the kingdom of God forward. The biggest barrier, I think, was Peter's own dreams. You see, as he began to dream of the expansion of the kingdom of God, I suspect he believed that in terms of the Jewish people. Now, you can't really fault him for that. Jesus was a Jew. His coming and even his uh, death were foretold in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Bible. Not only was Jesus a Jew, he practiced Jewish things. He, his disciples were all Jews worshiping at the temple. Uh, they really had a sense of their Jewishness. And so everything they had learned and knew about being Jewish, that the Messiah was coming within the Jewish community to lead the Jewish people. And he had, it makes perfect sense that he would imagine that that was going to be the case. But we are starting to see across Acts that that's changing a little bit. But we'll get into that in a second, but I really want you to think about your own dreams. What is it that you dream about? You know, as I think about our daydreams or the things we hope for, the things we look for, um, I don't know, maybe you've had some time to daydream lately. Do you dream of winning the lottery? That if you could just get a little bit more money, it'll solve all your problems and that life will finally be good? Do you dream of some physical change? Maybe something, I don't know, you're taller or, or stronger. Maybe you're more beautiful. And if, and if you had that, then, then you could really live out your dreams. Or, or perhaps maybe just health, that, that whatever ailment or thing that you're suffering, if that were just gone, then you could truly live out those dreams. Maybe it's a dream job or a dream person in your life that either somebody you know or that you wish they were different or somebody entirely that you don't know that you say, man, if I just had that kind of person in my life, then I would be living a life of dreams. Have you caught yourself daydreaming lately? What is the character and nature of those dreams? Are they similar to Peter's? Are they dreams where you are caught up in what God is suggesting and telling us to do and that you begin to dream about all the things? Not, not just things you want to do for God, but imagine yourself more and more the person that God wants you to be. I suspect that is, doesn't characterize most of our daydreams, most of our night dreams, most of the hopes that we have except in our better moments. And so we are caught in this need for a process. If indeed the biggest barrier to dreaming the dreams that God has for us is the very dreams we already have, that we must continually and repeatedly place those on an altar to allow those to die off, to put them aside, or to at least subjugate them to this larger dream that God has. And we need this constant process of giving our dreams over so that we can hear and see what it is that God has for us. How do we do that? How do we daydream God's dreams? How do we, and by that I don't mean the dreams he has, because God doesn't have dreams as much as he has plans and purposes but the dreams that he has for us, meaning that we would dream and vision and hope and anticipate. The key is that we get ourselves in a state of wanting what it is that God wants. That we try to be in a place where we die to ourself, our selfish dreams, our selfish hopes, and instead devote ourselves to what it is that we think God wants, knowing ultimately that's where we need to be. How do we do that? Well, one of the absolute keys and that I hope is something very vital and important in your life is worship. Worship is 
anything we do that decries the worthiness of God, worth-ship, like we might have friendship or relationship. It is a state of being of being in a relation or a state of being being in friends. Worthy-ship is, is about decrying the worthiness of God, being in the state of decrying that. And, and how do we do that? I have to tell you, one of the things I really, really miss as we have these stay-at-home orders is worship as we have been doing it from week to week, where we gather together on a Sunday morning and we sing songs together that speak of what we hope for, what we long for, our devotion to God. Uh, there's something really powerful about that. And yet, every one of those weeks, we, we have emphasized if not explicitly, at least we say explicitly in other cases, that for every week, that that's, that's not the only way to worship. There are certainly other ways, as valuable and as important, as meaningful as that is. Worship also happens in a whole bunch of different other realms. And here we are, living different and other, very different kind of ways. And, and maybe we have a chance Maybe I have a chance to really discover or rediscover what worship can be. Not to say this other is somehow unimportant and now I get to the important stuff, but maybe I learn what the important part of worship is in the midst of not being able to do it the usual way for me. Maybe I'm having my Matt Redman moment. You know the song, Matt Redman, uh, The Heart of Worship. The story goes, uh, this came out in the 90s as he was going to church. Uh, the pastor at the time, um, Pastor Mike, uh, began to sense that they weren't really treating music and worship the way they should. It, 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 they were getting away that it was becoming, well, not true worship. And so for a time, he did this very brave thing and said, you know, we're not going to do worship this way anymore, uh, at least for a time, for a season. We're going to strip some of these things away. And I want you to think about what it is that you bring to worship and that you bring something. And sometimes spontaneous songs would happen. I, I don't know all the details, but I do know that the words to Matt Redsman's song in the heart of worship, when all is stripped away, I will simply come. I'm coming back to the heart of worship because it's all about you, Jesus. If you're not familiar with the song, I, it's fortunate that it's there on YouTube somewhere. And it's worth listening and, and hearing those words that say, what is the heart of worship for you? And hopefully you're finding some of those things out. If you're having struggles, you know, maybe music is your thing and, and listening to pieces of music, maybe some of the music we offered this morning, uh, maybe some of uh, something on YouTube or Spotify or whatever technology, uh, maybe it's playing music that can really make your heart sing. Maybe it's going for a walk, maybe it's, it's meditation or fasting, or there is some kind of thing that is really helping you to cry the worthiness of God, to, to change your viewpoint on the worthiness of yourself and your own dreams and refocusing your attention on an almighty God of the universe. Another thing I might suggest that helps us understand what it is that God wants and to dream his dreams is not only getting in a state of, of wanting what God wants and admitting that his ways are better like we might in worship, but also for me, a big aspect of scripture. I don't know where you are uh, when it comes to uh, reading scripture. We have this amazingly valuable resource in being able to hear and read the words of God and try to get a better sense of what he wants and let him challenge us, I tell you. In my reading over these past few weeks, as I compare Scripture to who I am, I am coming up with, well, quite a gap. As I begin to see some parts about myself I don't like very much. And I know that can sound really depressing and really... But it's not. In many ways, it's really hopeful for me. You know, it's not that I enjoy being criticized or my flaws and weaknesses pointed out, the ways that I might be selfish or impatient, the ways that I might be undisciplined, the things that I, I see the, in myself compared to the way I see that God wants me to behave in Scripture. 
you know, it's, I think it's because of my relationship with Jesus. You see, I don't see God as this mean boss that's there to point out all the ways that I failed. I, I see him more like a physician. A, you know, when you go to the doctor and maybe you had this and you mentioned some pains and they begin to push, say, on your stomach and say, does this hurt? Does this hurt? Does this hurt? And, you know, if they hit a given spot and it hurts, they stop and they go, okay, it's not supposed to hurt there. We need to come up with a plan and, and a way forward so that it doesn't hurt there. That's, that's a sign that something's wrong. And so when I look at Scripture and I see the ways that I differ from how God wants me to be, how my picture of God differs from how I see God to be, or, or whatever, as I learn more and more, I, it's as if God and uses the Scripture and the Holy Spirit itself is pushing and saying, yeah, it's not supposed to hurt there. Let's see if we can't come up with ways that we go away from vice and towards virtue, that you become more and more what I want you to be. And is that it? Is that all it takes to dream the dreams that God has for us, to, to hear what God wants and to be willing to admit that He needs that it needs to be done and to start doing the things that He's asked us to do? Yeah. Sort of. It's it. That's it. That's what you and I need to do. That's, we need to work so much that we have a real personal relationship with God that we hear His voice and we long to do it. And then we go forth and make the necessary changes in our lives to do that. That is absolutely. But it wouldn't be enough because if that were all we needed, God would just give us a bunch of rules and a rule book and just say, hey, go do these things. It's not as simple as that. There is this ongoing transformation of our heart. And that is certainly worth talking about, but probably is going to be another sermon. I'm preaching primarily to, to talk to those of you who say, yes, I know I need a transformed heart, and part of my worship and connection with God is allowing that to happen. But the other thing I want to point out that was really powerful in this passage is that realize God is at work throughout the world. You see all the other things he was doing, and, and we begin to see how Peter is specifically does, being pushed to reach out beyond the Jewish nature of the origins of our faith. You know, we pointed out how Jesus was a Jew, the disciples were Jews, uh, the scriptures that Jesus talked about were Old Testament scriptures, as we see. And, and so, it, I don't know, we're not Jews, right? Why aren't we Jews? It, it's not self-evident. I mean, it may be to you and I because we've had this entire experience of not being Jewish. But can't we just go ahead and do Jewish things and then add Jesus? I mean, to a certain extent, we do do Jewish things. There are, there are Jewish, so to speak, parts of our faith. Uh, little whole ones, like the fact that we say amen at the end of prayers, is, comes from Hebrew, and it is, it's mentioned as far back as numbers of people using amen like that. And that, that was a Jewish thing. Uh, baptism, being baptized in water, immersed, and that was, was how you would convert into Judaism and, and was continued to hold and, and was as a symbol of conversion into Christianity. And uh, so those kind of things, certainly there are rituals, and there's nothing wrong with doing it, and there's nothing wrong with some of those kind of things. But why aren't we Jews? Well, part of it is the fact the temple's not there. I, I mean, to say that there's no way we could do the sacrifices in the temple as they were required and those kind of things that, that had been destroyed uh, shortly after uh, Jesus' life. And, and modern Jews really want that back. They, they long for that. You know, there's that wailing wall you often see pictures of, which was this outer wall of the temple. And it's the closest thing they have to the temple at this point. But in many ways, it's because and we're going to see this over the weeks ahead, that this isn't, it's, it's less about being Jewish or not being Jewish. It's more about your understanding of what at its core being Jewish is, and that we have, that Christ has called us to something vastly different. That, well, not vastly different, but deeper, more original to it. I, I, and I know for my Jewish friends, they would find this incredibly offensive, and I'm sorry about that. But really what we see Jesus doing is that he is suggesting that we've got something, as we better can understand Scripture, 
by looking at what it was always supposed to be, which is in many ways to point to Jesus. Take, for example, the sacrifices that happened at the temple, the, the animal sacrifices. And you see those happening and you wonder, well, like, why did God need that? And it's not that he needed it, but it was always a symbol to point us to the ultimate sacrifice that Jesus himself would be. We see God at work. And he was moving beyond this Jewish nature. And this is where Cornelius comes in. Luke, the writer of Acts, spends a lot of time talking about this conversion of Cornelius. Right now in this passage, we're just seeing him hungry and wanting to listen to the things of God. But we already see God at work. And he who was not a Jew, when it says a God-fearing one, it was, it was a Gentile. He wasn't necessarily Jewish. And he was necessarily not Jewish by being a Gentile. But was really interested in God and the things of God, and he was open, and God was working through him. And Peter is already launching out. He sees this vision of, of unclean food uh, coming and, and God telling him to eat it. And, and that has often been used to talk about how, well, that means that God doesn't necessarily want us to be kosher again. That's, that's not what this is saying. P Peter explains, it's pretty clear to him what it was supposed to mean, and that is, that the impurity that often delineates Jews from non-Jews is not what God wants us to hold on to. In fact, that it isn't impure for those who aren't Jews, that Cornelius is not impure and can be reached. You know, even this little throwaway line how Peter was staying with Simon the Tanner, which is not something that would normally, for the pure Jew, be acceptable. So we're beginning to see that God is breaking these ideas of purity down because he wants to reach a world beyond those who consider themselves descendants of Israel. So here's what I challenge you to do this week. Grab a Bible. Just start reading. You know, it's worth getting understanding, and maybe I should give you some direction if you have no idea where to start. I mean, when I was uh, younger, they said, oh, start in John. It has all the really cool passages like you must be born again and all those kind of things and tells the story of Jesus. I often recommend Mark to people because it's a shorter gospel that tells the story of Jesus. If you're ready for something a little more uh, to explain theology and how the whole system works, Romans is a great book. If uh, you want something more thinky, and I know Roman sounds really thinky, but Ecclesiastes is one of my favorite books as it really struggles with, you know, if we don't look at this life with God, then it becomes meaningless. And look at how meaningless everything is. And, and I find that really deep. It's one of my favorite books. So, but whatever it is, I think it's less about finding the right book and just getting in the habit of doing it. Do you realize according to, uh, well, there was a Lifeway uh, poll most Americans have never even read the Bible. Now, it's a little better for those who are part of uh, evangelical churches, and maybe we're closer to 50%, but that means nearly half of us have never read it. And I'm not suggesting you have to read it all from Genesis to Revelation, all in a year, or whatever plan you might have. But what if you just start picking it up and you start in some systematic way, bit by bit, each day? And I think the habit of a daily encounter with Scripture will make a difference. So grab a Bible. Read something until it, something hits you and then think about it and talk about it with God. Spend some time in worship, whether that's going for a walk or listening to music or dancing or whatever it is that might be this worship for you. And ask God to reveal to you what it might be that he is doing in this world. Where the Cornelius is now, is there a family in your neighborhood? Is there a family that, that, that God has been working on and he is starting to share and give dreams and visions to them and he is just waiting for you to catch that vision and to speak the words that he has longed for you to speak, that his kingdom might expand? I believe it's not only possible, I believe God is at work and he's calling you and me to be a part of it too. Let's grab a hold of that. Let's pray. Gracious and Heavenly Father, we say yes. We say yes to you. We want to catch your dreams. We want to be part of your vision. We want to be part of your kingdom.
Help us to see what it is that you want us to see and to respond with a yes, Lord. And help us to be part of this extraordinary adventure of changing the world because we're on the side of the world changer himself, Jesus Christ. We thank you for forgiving us for the ways that we blow it and that we get a chance yet again here today to say, forgive me for my past, lead me to the future. I give myself to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, in your times of worship, if uh, there's some time of prayer, I ask you to pray for me because I'll be praying for you.